Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Columbia Global Center in Paris, welcome. And thank you for joining our webinar titled COVID-19 Ethical Dilemmas in Human Lives. My name is Krista Fori, and I'm a part of the Paris Global Center team, who, along with the Columbia Global Centers of Amman, Istanbul, and Nairobi, are happy to be hosting this discussion. With us today is Dr. Smadar Bustan, who co-organized this webinar and who will be moderating. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Four ethical dilemmas will be presented, each being allowed 20 minutes of presentation time by two different medical professionals, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. During this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it using the meet and chat function at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as time will allow. Let's begin. Dr. Smadar Bustan. Okay. Well, welcome to our symposium on COVID-19 ethical dilemmas in human lives. Well, dilemmas put us in a situation of conflict where a difficult choice has to be made between different options. Medical ethical dilemmas even more so because they touch upon human lives. The COVID-19 pandemics oblige us all to handle many dilemmas, some of which we took upon ourselves, philosophers, eth ethicists, doctors and nurses to discuss today. Humbly, we may not be able to provide ready-made solutions, especially as the epidemic storm still rages. Thank you all for joining us today. For you, the healthcare workers, for what you're doing each day to overcome the COVID-19 virus. And thank you to the Paris Center of Columbia University and their wonderful team for hosting this event. We'll start with our first, um, with our first dilemma. Um, which will be shown on the screen. The first dilemma regards responsibility and what we're asking is, can medical food responsibility change in times of pandemic? Um, Mirko, Dr. Mirko Narcotti will start first and then I will follow. Mirko, I'm passing, it, I'm passing you the screen. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. Two months after the beginning of the crisis, I still have major problem to sleep. I dragged a body from bathroom to bedroom of a man, 50, 50 years old, died at home. I saw dozens of people alone, piled up in emergency room with severe dyspnea and eyes of fear. I speak by phone with my friend and, and I said to her, you have to choose between your father and your mother. I ran a night to my hospital, take a drug for sedation and came up and came, and came back to take care of an old man to die because my hospital was so crowded. I obeyed to a stupid order to transfer in Germany by flight an intubated man during the night and he died during the transport. I never spoke with his parent. I know many young anesthetists in my hospital decided alone who live and who die. I feel a persistent smell of people suffering on my skin. My sleeping light of an old humanitarian actor with some studies in bioethics is now a fire. 50 years later, Almata definition of primary health care seems, seems to me so needful. I did I watch it a lot in these two months, but my night question is, did I think enough? For this reason, I'm very grateful for this occasion to think. Bergamo is a rich and populated city of north of Italy, uh, one million of people, and one of the epicenter of the COVID-19 worldwide. Despite the generosity of the health workers, we live a severe 
humanitarian crisis that are stressing every aspect of the daily life. Outside is very difficult to understand because houses are closed by lockdown and are not destroyed as occurred with a, an outbreak. Furthermore, in regard to the dilemma of the moral responsibility, the World Health Organization numbers are, are not representative of the reality. The World Health Organization is doing a great job as usual, but the number provided are a dilemma as usually occurs during an outbreak. Today, WHO shows about 3,500,000 confirmed cases with 240,000 deaths worldwide. And in Bergamo, 13,000 confirmed cases with about 2,500 deaths. Unfortunately, the real death reported by municipalities are about 6,000, 7,000 deaths, about 1% of the population, 1%. Considering that the fatality rate of 20% is, is a nonsense, because Chinese experience, even uh, in uh, Hubei province, reported a fatality rate between 1% and 3%. The amount of the people contaminated in Bergamo is probably 25, 50% of the population. More than 2,000 people with moderate severe hypoxia during the peak of the outbreak stayed home because all the hospitals were overcrowded. These are the real number. These are the pictures of the Bergamo disaster. For this reason, we wrote the paper appeared in the New England of Journal in regard to the dilemma of the moral responsibility in a time when the global medical community is called to face a pandemic of unprecedented scale, scale with little scientific evidence and crazy numbers that describe the situation, advocacy honest and forthcoming is an ethical duty. It, is, it was a wake up for those involved in system preparedness and strategic planning. An outbreak is not a simple illness, but is a social phenomenon. Historical and context elements, for example, intensive promiscuity between animals and humans are key factors for an outbreak development and spread. A first consequence of this translation into the social horizon concerned the theme of their responsibility. And in regard to the dilemma of the moral responsibility, how much does the social narrative of on the numbers, on contagion weight, for example, on the decision and the concept that guide them, for example, uh, that the proportionality. Narratives that are not very accurate from an epidemiological point of view, such, such as those that are taking place uh, in, uh, in how much do they affect the judgment in situation. Take that takes place in triage or in prevention strategy in other country. How many images are needed when the number are not uh, realable? Another aspect of, of the dilemma of the moral responsibility concerns the care of decision-making process and the continuous connection of individual fragments of responsibility. Modern Western medicine have centralized the care of the patient in the hospital and our region is very representative of that process reducing the power of the community to be an actor of the public health and put in place an expropriation of the health, as Ivan Illich said in Medical Nemesis. Body has been progressively fragmented in small pieces by super specialized doctors 
and responsibility is even more a question, a question of legal responsibility, a money matter, and not an ethical matter. In this fragmentation of the responsibility, has been acceptable for us to execute orders, even if epidemic dangerous or not ethical, because we live in an urgent situation and during the fight against COVID-19, the mantra is to do and do not think. It seems like an errant aren't wrote in the banality of evil, nobody was responsible or rather nobody felt. They just did their job. Would a control mechanism of the decision makers in Bergamo in close contact with the territories have been useful? Only the awareness that the weight of, of the decision must be shared in a dialogical contest, allow us not to turn triage into a moment of uh, irresponsible superhomism. Another aspect of the dilemma of moral responsibility is the ethic of the research in urgent situation. As Derek Angus wrote in Viewpoint in JAMA, one stark example of, is the debate over whether to prescribe available therapies such as chloroquine or, or test this drug in randomized clinical trials. At the heart of the problem is one of the oldest dilemmas in human organization, the exploitation exploration trade-off. Exploitation refers to the just to do it option and exploration refers to the must learn option. During his captivity in uh, 1940 years, Archibald Cochrane treated many prisoners, often ill with tuberculosis, observing how the disease benefited more from a good caloric intake than from drugs or of uncertain, if not any efficacy. The germs of evidence-based medicine arose from those observations. 80 years later, in regard to the dilemma of moral responsibility, how many helmets to, de to deliver inspiratory assistance are placed without any enteral feeding in Bergamo. Chloroquine, antiviral, anti 6, anti-complements, steroids, antibiotics have been administrated without a real methodologic, methodological approach, without monitoring, with people who arrived at the hospital consumed by days of dyspnea. What data, what ethical research can be produced in this confusion? As we know for data analysis, garbage in and garbage out, even if you publish in an important indexed medical journal. Dr. Nicotti, we're going to have to turn over to Dr. Bustan very shortly. Yeah. Furthermore, in regard to the lemma or moral responsibility, what about the consensus extorted for a Hispanic patient with no family next to it? Derek Angus suggests at the end of the JAMA viewpoint that an integrated approach of learning while doing is, a sh is essential in this crisis. However, in this context, it's very important to not lose the capacity to think and probably we have to revise it in an approach of thinking by doing, like Hannah Arendt suggests. I'm finishing. Goises, a philosopher co-author of the New England articles, says that it's not true, nothing will be as before. Millions of people in the world will, will, will be more 
vulnerable and isolated, but the mechanisms leading at this pandemic humanitarian disaster are still present. Doctors have to give back to the community the capacity to promote their health. Could say Ivan Illich today. Thank you. Thank you, Mirko. Um, I will continue this uh, part of the first, our first dilemma on responsibility. Um, I am uh, Smadar Boustan. I teach philosophy and bioethics and medical humanities at the University of Paris Diderot. And I have been working as a scientist conducting experimental and clinical studies regarding human pain and suffering to develop um, a tool for suffering diagnosis of chronic patients. Um, the dilemma Dr. Mirko Narcotti and I are discussing today mm -hmm. bears on responsibility, a Latin term from 1590, responsus or response, which became philosophically prominent rather late in the 18th century, leading us to ask here, does responsibility and more specifically medical responsibility change in times of pandemics? Is responsibility limited in the avalanche of an infectious trans transcontinental disease, obliging us to relieve clinicians from the burden of decision-making process carried out in individual cases. A broader conceptualization of the sense of responsibility is necessary in order to deal with this dilemma by first asking, what does it mean to be responsible in times of pandemics? Responsible behavior during the coronavirus infection outburst was very much present in every household and country around the globe. Yet lack of knowledge raised significant inconsistency. And we started, and you hear the horn, sorry. And we started doubting what it means to act in a responsible manner, both personally and collectively. The problem with um, with the pandemic is that the personal and the social intermingle to the extent that the most casual individual acts such as coughing, sneezing, going out of our homes or walking around maskless turns a person into a biological agent engaging into irresponsible behavior that some would qualify as criminal or immoral. This epidemic has been enhancing mutual accountability to such an extent that individual responsibility is allocated from the self to a self intrinsically bound to others. One can no longer exert free will to live it carelessly and be perpetrated to risk contamination. What we have learned from the pandemics as a globalized society is that individual responsibility is no longer exclusively centered on what we are bound to undertake by duty of a person being responsible for something, a parent for their child, a doctor for their patient. Since simply by being, breathing, existing, we are accountable for others, all of us together and every one of us individually. Unfortunately, under such circumstances, our responsibility become as valuable as valuable, vulnerable, excuse me, as we are. The fragility of a pandemic causing this involuntarily um, responsibility by existence leads us back to our main dilemma when asking what motivates us to make the right choice for a responsible act? How do we know fully what the right act is? how to best choose in a relation to our means and to whatever is in our power, meaning we just do our best or the best we can. In other words, responsibility is guided by a reasoned thought about what we can change and about the means that lead us to these better ends, especially in times of health crisis. But what if this entire perspective of being responsible based on reasoned thought leads to being morally irresponsible, medically irresponsible, humanly irresponsible, you remember Mirko Narcotti's example of triage and the treatment using experimental, experimental drugs without evidence-based medicine. Let me explain. I'm going beyond the first form I spoke about of responsibility by existence. To examine medically relevant form of responsibility by deliberation, I introduced the idea of making a choice as a result of a deliberation and of fully knowing what is the right thing to do. Aristotle, in his account of ethics, very much like John Stuart Mill with his utilitarianism almost two millennia later, examines what is good for the human being, what we need to undertake, aim at, or act upon in order to do good. In our case, medicine aims at health and physicians aim at healing. In this respect, what Aristotle also told us is that when we deliberate, we always have some end in view. 
if I deliberate about whether to put a mask, I consider this in light of a future end in view, which is to avoid catching or spreading the, co the COVID-19. If I deliberate about whether to respect the extreme social distancing of the lockdown and to stay at home, I consider this in the light of a, f of a future end in view, that is to slow down and eventually stop the epidemic spread. Aristotle claims, however, that, that there are two things we cannot deliberate about, deliberate about facts and, and views for the simple reason that we cannot change them. Hence, our choice based on deliberation of doing good and acting responsibly are dependent on end purposes and on sticking to the facts, or in other words, on sticking to knowledge. At the same time, if during the COVID-19 pandemics we apply this philosophical recipe with reason-based choices regarding medical responsibilities, we soon realize that clinicians are, are being severely undermined, which only intensifies our dilemma. In reality, we have witnessed misinformation emanating from reports and communications, including from public health authorities through inaccurate or misguided narratives. For example, smokers who are less likely to be contaminated or the virus is unstable at high temperatures. Furthermore, at the outbreak of the pandemic, the end view of medicine and its therapeutic goals shifted from healing to prevention from dying totally destabilizing the standard medical end views. We could simply proclaim that without a solid foundation to rely upon for making choices, the entire undertaking of medical and social responsibility is bound to perplexities. De facto, medical professionals must respond mm -hmm. with, when facing flows of COVID patients with severe respiratory and uh, distress. But do they need in this unique scenario to take responsibility for their medical response? A comprehensive approach should be compatible with, ex uh, with extent principles of responsibility under the given circumstances. A broad approach to analyze responsibility for pandemic diseases should consider both forms of responsibility, responsibility by existence and responsibility by deliberation. This would better be for overall, overall for the society and promoting more careful policies and actions. To complete or, or end this part of uh, this intervention, I just wanna say that none of these perspectives that uh, have been actually presented uh, here has paid full attention to a third form of responsibility based on an entirely different pattern and that provides a way out of this dilemma. This view consists in arguing that responsibility is involuntary, not bound to rational choice, and certainly not a deliberate one. Becoming responsible for the sick is imposed upon us by his needy, vulnerable presence when calling for help, often without words, rather conveyed by misery and facial expressions. This sense of responsibility goes beyond that of commitment or rationalized duty. Just like the first form of responsibility by existence, it separates one from oneself by giving precedence to the person who is weaker and more at risk. I'm referring here, as some of you might have guessed, to a concept of Levinas who considered the experience of responsibility as what binds one person to another and as demonstrated by his well-known theme of face-to-face. -face. I have to admit that in my work, I always criticize this uncompromised level of responsibility and priority leaving us claims we can grant another person when we are ourselves sick or in, ca or in case of clinicians when they are themselves at risk. But when I caught the coronavirus at the beginning of the outburst here in France, the sense of responsibility and giving priority to the well-being of another took over me. My symptoms were mild but sudden. I fell down on the floor without being able to get up, feeling the chill and honestly a fright. While lying on the floor, what bothered me most was the possible contamination of my children. I was sick, not being able to give anything, let alone move my body. And yet, just like Levinas claims, although the others here are my children, so that, that this interested sense of responsibility towards another invaded me and my responsibility for not contaminating them became my absolute priority. It was not a voluntary or deliberated sense of responsibility, and it very much obsessed me when I was most helpless. Levinas proposes that responsibility does not originate from within oneself, but rather as an order or command that one receives. It precedes us in the sense that it originates from a prior time and one's ancestors. It is pre-original. 
To conclude, I would just like to say that in transposing this view to our discussed dilemma of medical responsibility, it soon has become clear that what stems from this sense of duty of a caregiver or a medical worker is not a Greek agency or, or freedom to choose the good, but a fundamental archaic obligation of oneself towards another, and that it commends me and ordains me to the other. In this perspective, this amounts to saying that our dilemma is cancelled since no judgment can be made about treatment or availability of the medical caregivers. Their mere presence beside a COVID patient's bed is a celebration of being there for the patient and of human responsibility at its best. Thank you very much. We will now move uh, to take questions for uh, the, this session about responsibility. Um, Krista, do you want to read us some of the few questions? And since we are uh, just... Uh, the first session, maybe we can just take one. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Bustan. At present, I'm seeing more um, thanks than questions. Uh, we do have a viewer who thanks uh, both yourself and Dr. Nakoti for both your testimony and your analysis. Um, we will try to um, contact Dr. Nakoti to have his paper put um, uh, for the public to see through our website, if that's possible. Um, my guess is that people are still kind of figuring out how to use the, the Q&A down at the bottom. So um, I just want to say that because some people entered in the middle, uh, the way we're going to have the discussion are based on questions that you're going to write to us in the chat at the bottom or converse in French. So you can just uh, write to them. I would like to quickly ask uh, Mirko, um, do you feel that your sense of responsibility during this you know, being in Bergamo is like the Swiss Italian area, so rich, but still overwhelmed with what has happened to you. Do you think that it's kind of undermined your sense of medical responsibility? Do you feel a sense of it under, from following what you said and all the things you raised, you felt that at the core of things, at the bottom of things, that your medical responsibility as a caregiver was endangered? I think the, the issue of their responsibility is one of the key uh, of the lecture of this crisis. And I think that this crisis uh, uh, give uh, exactly an idea of the responsibility of the people because everything uh, is so fast, everything is so evident, so many people that die, so many people ill. And so uh, it's more clear now than in, in the peace time, uh, what the people think. Okay, I'd like to, thank you, Mirko. I'd like to read, um, uh, Krista, a, a question that was asked by, uh, um, I will not say names, just to keep uh, privacy. Yeah. I have a question. We have uh, a number of questions coming in, uh, Dr. Buzdan, just so, you, just so you know. Yeah, do you believe there is a direct link between people's approach um, do you think there's a direct link between, peop between people's approach to survival and their sense of responsibility for the survival of others? So she addressed this to me, so I'll just, uh, and then Mirko can say from uh, his point of view. I think obviously there's, of course, a direct link. Um, in this period of time, what we're all experienced, I mean, I'm talking this as a patient here, not as a, of course, medical personnel. Uh, you, you did, there is a sense of survival that outcasts us. And, but I do think for me at least, and from my perspective ethically, I think it enhances the sense of responsibility we have for others because for the simple reason is that we are endangered ourselves, and this is not no longer a theory, it's in practice. So your whole being is being uh, put into questions and especially your being as part of other, you know, a society of other people because most of us were closed in in our homes and had or, or not, but, or maybe went and outside, but we had immediate impact 
on other people. So obviously the sense of survival, survival in my view, only enhanced the sense of responsibility for others. So uh, Mirko, do you want to say something? We have uh, 30 seconds. No, I think it's a question for you. Okay. <laughs> So, um, should we pass to the, thank you very much, Mirka. It was uh, uh, very interesting, this whole dialogue that we already started off screen and now we continue it on screen. Uh, and thank you very much for your intense work and everything you and your teams have done in the past few months, um, both for the uh, local community and to the, for the international community. So thank you very much. Krista, so. Uh, yes, did you, do you feel we have time for one more question? Or shall we move to the second dilemma? Yeah, fortunately, because I, I don't want to take time from... Okay, then why don't we move now to the second dilemma? And Smadar, if you'd like to go ahead introducing. Thank you. So this, our second dilemma is due regards fairness. And what we are asking here is, is that in, time, in a time of emergency with uh, scarce equipment and uh, contaminated medical staff, where do we draw the line of whom we treat and whom we cannot, who will live and who will die? And it's obviously concerns the question of triage. Um, the first uh, speaker will be Catherine Fishkoff from, uh, she's a doctor from New York. And uh, then it will follow with uh, Milan Butbulbaum, uh, who's, who's professor of philosophy. Um, so, uh, Catherine, are you yes. with us? Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about fairness. Um, I'm a surgeon and uh, intensivist in New York. I, I'm also an ethics consultant. And fairness has really been a driving principle behind our approach to um, the COVID response here. Um, as of last night, we had about 117,000 cases in New York City alone with over 11,000 deaths here. Um, it's, it's just, it's apocalyptic. And I would say that we might have had the benefit of, um, of watching the events of China and Europe and Italy in particular unfold to give us a little bit of a leg up, but I don't think that anybody could have been really prepared for, for what hit us here. Um, but but what what was interesting about the crisis as it unfolded is that it presented us with with um, issues of fairness, and and it turned out that there is a real spectrum of fairness. Um, and I think that you'll see as I kind of as I describe our experience here, how. Um, addressing one one issue of fairness led to another um, fairness dilemma. Um, so I should start by saying that here in New York um, or here in the United States, we have a very strong cultural and legal emphasis on patient and surrogate or family autonomy. Um, I'm aware that this is a very American phenomenon and has a strong basis in it's, it's, it's a historical throwback um, and also a function of us being so resource rich and never really having turned anybody away. Um, but New York State has a law, the New York State, um, the Family Healthcare Decision Act, which essentially says that um, physicians cannot withhold or withdraw care over objection of a patient or a family member. Um, and that just sort of sets the, the cultural context in which um, we are when the COVID pandemic hit. And in response to the pandemic then, because of this, this history of ours, um, the governor of our state, rather than um, activate or create a triage system, decided that he would just provide us with all of the ventilators that we needed um, and that we wouldn't turn anybody away. So that actually what ended up happening in our hospital here at Columbia, normally we have 117 ICU beds. And at our peak, um, which was about a week or two ago, we had nearly 300 ICU patients um, in our hospital. This was an, an enormous and heroic effort. Um, it was remarkable. Um, we have patients, we converted our operating rooms, we converted our PACUs, our cath labs. Um, every available space became offices, became ICU, um, ICU beds. 
Um, and so I would say that we essentially went from what the Institute of Medicine would call conventional capacity to crisis capacity overnight. Um, and in doing so, no one was turned away. Um, I should mention that um, here in the United States after the, the H1N1 outbreak about 10, 15 years ago, the flu outbreak, um, many states developed a resource allocation plan um, in the event of crisis capacity when, when all of, when, you know, in such a time that resources were overwhelmed. Um, and, and our New York State ventilator um, allocation guidelines are publicly available. You can find them on the, on the internet. Um, but it was essentially built on the principle, the ethical principle of fairness, that no one would be turned away um, from a ventilator or denied access to a ventilator based on um, social or economic factors, but it would be based on um, medical decision making. And so the guidelines that were proposed at the time was that um, if a patient, assuming we were in crisis capacity or you know, that we were overwhelmed, that if a patient came in and was determined to need a ventilator, there was an immediate set of exclusion criteria. And these were things like um, uh, traumatic brain injury or uh, unwitnessed or recurrent cardiac arrest, for example. Um, and if, if you met any of those exclusion criteria right off the bat, you would not be given a ventilator. You would be given continued medical care, you'd be offered palliative care services, but you would not get a ventilator. Um, if a patient needed an ICU uh, or a ventilator and didn't meet those exclusion criteria, but the idea was that there were just too many patients for the amount of ventilators available, they would go then into a triage system. And the triage system that was built was again based on the principle of fairness that um, the triage committee that would take over the decision making at that point would be removed from the patient. The committee would be made up of a number of people who were not directly involved in the patient care um, and would use a, a very specific algorithm. Um, in the case of the, the published guidelines, this was based on SOFA, although we now know that um, SOFA is not um, necessarily applicable. But anyway, the idea was that um, patients would be given access to ventilators based purely on medical decision making and having nothing to do with their social or economic factors. In fact, the triage committee wouldn't even get that. But um, in order to activate a triage committee, this would require legislative and governmental action. And that was just something that nobody had the stomach here for. And so instead, what we did was double and triple our ICU capacity, um, which brought us then to the next question of fairness, which is, is it fair to activate, um, uh, well, the question was, could you activate, would it be more fair to activate a triage system and maybe turn people away um, if the other alternative was to continue to expand and expand our capacity? And so that's what we did. We entered crisis capacity um, very, very quickly. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here. But we entered crisis capacity very, very quickly. Um, and this presented us with yet another dilemma of fairness. Um, our resources were stretched so, so incredibly thin. We have I, I just had an ICU call overnight. I, I had a night shift last night where as an intensivist, I oversaw the care of 42 critically ill patients. And in normal times, I oversee the care of 10, maybe 15 at most patients at any given time. Um, our nursing ratios are something close to one to four or one to five at our peak. Whereas normally we take our nursing ratio in the ICU is one to one or sometimes one to two. Um, the strain on resources was incredible. Um, and this was driven by our, our, our desire to not turn anybody away. And I'll just take one second to focus on a particular um, example, which was our need for dialysis. Um, in our hospital, about 25% of patients in the ICU um, needed dialysis, and we just didn't have the number of machines. And again, it, this idea of not turning anybody away, um, we had to find alternatives. And so what we ended up doing was rather than um, providing 24 hours of continuous dialysis, which is what we normally would do, um, we decided that patients would share machines. And so you would get 12 hours of dialysis and then the next 12 hours the machine would be given to somebody else. Um, just demonstrating again, the dilemma of fairness. Is it fair to take care of everybody, but maybe not as well, um, rather than take care of fewer patients, um, but at our normal standard of care? 
Um, there are lots of feelings here about whether this was the right or the wrong thing to do, um, but this is how it unfolded here in New York, and I'm 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 very interested to hear from Italy that things obviously unfolded very differently, and I'd be curious to hear what what other people's experiences are as well as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fishkoff. Um, we're going to turn over now to Dr. Botbal Baum. Are you with us? I am. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah, you can talk, uh, Milen. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Okay. So I'm very glad um, to join this meeting. I was very, very much interested by the testimonies of the two medical doctors we heard, uh, and especially with uh, uh, what Catherine just said, because this is what I will address, although she addressed the notion of, of fairness very, very well in terms of uh, the tension between fairness and equality of treatment. So as Christine has been addressing the issue of, of fairness from a regular, regulatory perspective and the responsibility of the mayor of New York that has decided to protect medical doctors from trial when they take reasonable decision. So he, he gave them the responsibility of decision in the context of emergency, since there are a lot of conflict of interest, of course, and interpretation around the very word of fairness and even about what constitutes a fairness dilemma. So can we have fairness in an unfair system or in a non-egalitarian context? Because I see that the responsibility uh, Dr. Katrin Fischkoff takes on her shoulders is just almost infinite. So what I'm asking is, can we take seriously the health system capacity of anticipation that refers to public health at large since the issue of fairness is nonetheless a biopolitical issue? And New York, as you said, is a, uh, opulent city and you have a lot of money so the choice you made of accepting as much patient as, as you could was uh, uh, not only a rational decision but uh, an ethical decision but nonetheless we have to ask who gets health resources um, can it be based on meritocracy, age, or functioning of the person, as you said, uh, if, if you have a heart issue, you won't receive a respirator, but we, we can rationalize this decision. So can we apply the same principle to all COVID-19 and non-COVID patients? Why would we give priority to COVID patients if we have cancer patients? So according to most bioethicists, referring to uh, this utilitarian principle, pragmatic principles, maximizing benefits is the most important, as well as a principle of care versus stewardship of resources. And this is precisely the dilemma you, you were describing. So prioritization should aim at both saving the most lives and allowing the empowerment of individuals post-treatment, because we can hope there would be a post-treatment and we have to think about the handicaps treatment will provoke for some of them. So the, the notion of prioritization should aim at both saving the most lives and allowing empowerment of this individual post-treatment, what we call uh, DALIs, which means to assure future years of life with minimum handicap of any sort. But what about the subjective perception of the quality of life of, of these patients? So what kind of dilemma are we confronted here? As you said, Kat Catherine, and you underlined the dilemma of provi providing below st uh, standard care for all patients versus normal standards for fewer patients. So this is a true dilemma. Uh, it's a dilemma between equality versus quality of care equality of access versus quality of care. Um, so how does the notion of fairness lead us to respond to this question? 
it seems to me that there is no dilemma here if the basis principle of care that we should maximize care we are speaking here of New York, which has a very good public health system and has prolonged a social distancing more than other states in, in America. So we are confronted to a different form of a dilemma because we could use the argument of moral intuition. Of course, moral intuition will tell us, let's give care to a maximum of people because we think in the instant of the decision. And then we have the argument of symmetry or the argument of incommensurability of um, persons who need treatment more than others. So as you said, Catherine, um, the extreme shortage of dialysis came into conflict with caring for all, which does not support a systematic account of triage. And the modern notion of dilemma confront us to an impossible choice. All road to exclude the possibility of dilemma, of at least moral rules, are precisely established in order to prescribe a choice of one action and exclude the other. So that the problem of dilemma is always divided into question and it's in the etymology of the world. Uh, you have first the epistemological choice where it is logically difficult to determine what is my duty or my responsibility in face of the scarcity of ventilators for instance do i have, do I have a rational argument to to choose for one person or the other and um, so you are confronted to a conflict of obligations one obligation would be uh, stronger than the other and if the obligation is stronger than the other and you think uh, the COVID patients need more care than the dialysis patient then the conflict is not a real one because you can solve it quite easily and the other scenario is when the two obligation seems equivalent to you and you want to give equal care and you say why should I uh, not care for the dialysis patient and only for the COVID patient so um, here we face facts and rules that can be consistent only in context. And that's why I think uh, the decision of the mayor is very good because only the medical doctor can decide in context and not only with abstract rules. And we have to think of what is my world during the pandemics? Is it a consistent world where logical decisions are sufficient to be responsible. As, and it, as it was said by uh, the former intervention, uh, we are not in a rational world anymore. So I realize that rules are only useful if there are circumstances in a possible world of coherence. So that my duty in such a situation seems that there is a clear hierarchy between the duty of care and the efficiency rule of how much do I have to take in patients in my hospital, which is precisely what I call the moral intuition, which might be in tension with the efficiency logic of a public health et ethics during a pandemic, where the collectivity comes before the individual as if the collectivity was not constituted by individuals. So here I would prefer the bottom-up approach that combines moral intuition and rationality around the notion of quality of life because it associates fairness to a subjective vision of quality of life or standard of living, not only in the present instant, but in the biography of uh, the patient. Indeed, the concept of fairness was developed within a framework in which taste or values, although differ between individuals, remain constant. So the notion is hard to use in the contingency of pandemics because precisely values can be reversed upside down and egalitarian care 
becomes a priority over the rationing of care. Thank you, Dr. Botbalbom. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm sorry. I think we're going to uh, go to some questions now. Uh, Dr. Bustan, I believe you received a question if you'd like to begin. Yeah, I, first I want to say that I'm sorry we, we had dozens of questions for the first session on responsibility, uh, which we haven't seen. They came a bit after I was, uh, I ended or anyway, there was some, maybe some technical issues. So I'm sorry, but we'll try to do with questions that we are not able to answer today because there are so many. Um, we are going to publish all these acts in a, together and we could put the link and we'll try to take into consideration uh, uh, all your questions, maybe in writing this way, people who would like to follow us. I'm sorry, we are limited by time and technology here. So there were um, several questions, and thank you very much, uh, Michelle and Catherine. Um, I I'm trying to group them in order to be fair towards everybody. It's a fairness uh, session. Um, so, um, Dr. Fishkov, Catherine, um, there were Lot, few, there were a lot of questions there. Are, some of them are practical and a uh, few repeated the, the idea of the, the question, why did um, SOFA, which I don't know what it refers to, uh, did not work? So maybe if you can explain, but mostly the, the question that really repeats itself is um, a question related to minorities and uh, race. I, um, I'm trying to group a few questions uh, from a social worker from Pennsylvania and a few other people who are actually uh, asking, how do we, how do you explain, and I think we could, uh, Milen, you could answer this too because you've been working on these things. Um, uh, so they say great insights on the principle of, of fairness in the American context, uh, doctor, and how, how do you explain the role of medical decision-making in the huge disparity in COVID-19 deaths? depending on race, blacks being extremely overpresented in the casualties, curious to see how the, that differs from discussions in the UK. And I just wanna add that um, we had the same, there's same questions about uh, minorities, race, and also people from uh, less privileged, privileged societies. So uh, if both of you could answer this question, thank you. Thank you. These questions are phenomenal and are all of the questions that we're asking ourselves. I'll just two seconds on SOFA because it's not really an ethical dilemma, but the SOFA is this sequential organ failure assessment tool. It's a quick um, way to see how sick a patient is essentially. And it was initially used in a lot of these guidelines to try and um, sort out who may or may not survive. The problem is that it doesn't appear to correlate that well with survival in COVID. Um, and in fact, it probably doesn't correlate that well in survival, maybe in general, but it, it was a quick and dirty way to try to figure out who would live um, or who could be predicted to survive. Um, and it seems that it probably doesn't work. So what people, at least in the COVID context, so what people have been doing is trying to just um, design other scores and um, um, ways of assessing who might survive and who, who wouldn't. Um, but nobody has really, there hasn't been one uniform assessment tool. Um, with regard to the disparities in, 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 um, in health outcomes among race, this has just been, um, it's remarkable. Um, my, my hospital is in a community that is um, largely Hispanic, um, and we have seen um, mortality rates that other hospitals have not seen. Um, and, and this has been borne out across all kinds of communities. So I don't think that it has much to do with the hospital care. My sense is that it has everything to do with the care and access to care um, and resources and environment um, that people are living in before they come to the hospital. Um, we have um, we have a problem here in the United States with access to care and underrepresentation of poor and 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 um, pe poor people and and people of um, color, uh, and that this has been a um, a sad manifestation of what everybody kind of already knew. Um, and just as to answer the last question, and I'll turn it over this this question of um, how we're going to do this in the future. Um, I appreciate the question very much. We, we, um, I, I would say that we responded as best as we could. I think we did what we needed to do. However, um, 
we are anticipating the possibility of a second wave. We don't know when it will be. We don't know how it will come. Um, but one of the most important things I think we need is to gather data. Um, and somebody had mentioned, um, you know, the knowledge gap that we have in COVID. I think um, piece number one is for us to work collectively um, to gather as much information as we can on um, what works and what doesn't work and what the outcomes are in COVID patients so that we can better prepare ourselves for the next round. And I, um, I think, you know, we have shut our doors to anybody who is not COVID. There are thousands of patients who have life-threatening illnesses, cancer, heart disease, vascular disease, who are not getting treatment. And I think if we have a second wave, I'm not sure that we can or should do what we did this time. Um, we may have to think a little bit more carefully about how we approach pro patients. And this may require some sort of a triage system the next time around. Um, but in order to do that, we would need some sort of um, coming together. We, we, I, I would like to say that we've had a crisis of conscience here in the United States about how we treat everybody, but I don't think that that's true. Um, I think we need to have really hard conversations about people's access to care at end of life and how much resources we throw at everybody. And I think this is a conversation we need to have soon before, um, before we are hit with the next the next round. Yes. Um, Thank you. I, uh, I Dr. Fofaldum, did you want to address this question as well? Uh, yes, uh, um, I totally agree with what uh, Christine just said and uh, the fact that the notion of triage is a reflection of uh, the notion of fairness in a society. So if you don't have fairness outside, it's very difficult to correct it inside. And uh, the problem with triage, as you said, is uh, that if you give priority to COVID patients, then you exclude uh, some illness that are linked to poverty or to uh, lack of access to health. So this notion of triage is unfair from the beginning. We have to rethink the triage by um, a notion that would be inclusive instead of being uh, exclusive to COVID, I think. But as you said, in, although you have a very rich hospital, you had to make choices. And I would think we have to reflect why COVID patients would be more an urgency in our societies than uh, a cancer or a dialysis patient. I, I don't agree on this uh, hierarchy. I think it's linked uh, to a representation we have of COVID as a threat to our all species, which is perhaps very irrational. Because if we compare even uh, the very big um, numbers of deaths we have with these pandemics, uh, we have also to uh, compare it with cancer patients. Okay, cancer is an epidemic today. So why give priority to, to COVID? And uh, when people ask questions about race, they ask questions about the rationality of the triage, it seems to me. Thank you. We, we, we did receive uh, questions also from oncologists regarding this, uh, saying that their patients are totally left out. Mm -hmm due to the priority given to COVID patients. So I'm very grateful for you to, um, to raising these two aspects of fairness, both from a triage for COVID patients, but also the lack of fairness resulting for other uh, illnesses and, and patients. Um, Krista, would you like to uh, present a second, the next question? Sure, I think we have uh, just a little bit of time if you'd both like to, uh, to weigh in on this. We have a, a question uh, regarding the triage algorithms that were spoken of before. Uh, what were the criteria used uh, by the triage algorithms that you'd mentioned? Um, I guess I would, since I only have 10 seconds, <laughs> I would refer people, um, you, there are um, New York State ventilator allocation guidelines. You can find that online and it's a, it's a, a flow chart. Um, Minnesota um, also has their guidelines posted. Again, no, no hospital in the country that I'm aware of ever formally activated their triage um, system. Um, so these are all technically um, sort of theoretical in what one might do. 
Um, but, but you will see that they're all fairly consistent in their approach. Um, but one thing that has changed in the context of COVID is the actual um, calculation of how to decide. And I think most people who are in critical care feel that to some extent, we can kind of quickly identify those patients who are likely to survive versus not, but it's very hard to quantify on paper. And that's been a real problem with designing these systems. Well, um, I want to thank you both very much uh, you. for participating and contributing. Uh, it was very interesting. I think uh, what you said, uh, Catherine, really resonates with the beginning of Miracle about their ex kind of terrible experience, terrible experience of triage at the beginning in Italy and especially Northern Italy. So thank you for speaking. Thank you, Milan, very much for your insights about intuition. I think it's worth further discussion. Um, we will now, I mean, I'm sorry for, I know there's so many questions. We, we're not able to take all of them, but we will try to further them later. Thank you both. And I would like uh, now uh, to pass, if possible, to the third uh, dilemma we had, uh, the dilemma regarding uh, dignity. Uh, and we, what we're asking is, uh, during the pandemic, um, does the need for, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not seeing the screen for some reason. Uh, yes, during the pandemic, um, during the pandemic, does the need for increased awareness of potential harm to the public justify impinging upon patients' rights to bodily and personal dignity and privacy? And um, our first speaker will be uh, Laure Madé. She's a nurse from uh, France. And uh, Rita Sharon, who's uh, from the US, who's the founder of narrative medicine, of the field of narrative medicine. So uh, Law, if uh, Law actually, Law actually works in the hospital of, um, where I teach at the faculty school. Um, Lord, are you uh, there? We'll wait for her. Uh, actually, the, the, the hospital where Law works is this called Hospital Bichat, and uh, it's in Paris. It's one of the hospitals that were uh, the first ones to um, to receive COVID uh, patients. Um, so I would like to pass the, to turn to Law. If uh, I think we have, in oh, thank you. The screen is yours. <laughs> um, so I'm a nurse uh, in a Paris uh, hospital. Uh, where I'm working on the, in a COVID department. And um, all over in France, we have been overwhelmed by COVID-19 media coverage. Um, and many patients in artificial coma were exposed on TV news. Um, so I, I didn't experience this. I'm in a, a COVID ward. I'm not working in an ICU, but I think that's uh, showing, you know, the dilemma of um, the patient's dignity. Um, so in France, um, if you are a patient, uh, you need to give your consent um, for a TV documentary, for example. But it's not the case when you're unconscious. Um, as long as your uh, face is covered, uh, your body can be exposed to the TV. Um, and I know some of our colleagues um, have not been always, you know, very um, okay with this, but um, there's something they really couldn't know anything about it. Um, they did that to raise um, awareness of potential harm to the public, um, but that's a really important question about uh, the personal dignity and privacy. Um, I think uh, there might be a small cultural difference uh, in France in terms of privacy. Um, that could be explained what we, we've seen. But beyond the media issue, uh, we are still facing many dilemma in terms of patients' dignity and privacy during this um, COVID, out COVID outbreak. Um, First, uh, our patients, um, all of them are really, f you know, like um, they are, they are, yes, 
they are in fear. Uh, it's all over the news and uh, they arrive in the hospital and they're very scared. And on top of that, you are um, with all your uh, personal protective equipment, with your mask on, they can't, they can't even, you know, like uh, recognize you from your other colleagues or the doctor and everyone looks the same and it's very scary. Um, so as health worker, we try to make it, you know, um, as comfortable as possible. Uh, we try to, um, you know, do what we can to make them comfortable. Um, but it's true that there is a lack of communication, either verbal and nonverbal. Um, because you can't access the room as often as you can. You need to um, um, restrict your visit in the room. So we were lucky enough in Paris um, for our patients. So they still can keep their phone, so they can still have um, uh, contact with their loved ones and with their friends. And it's already um, a really big help. Um, if you compare this to ICUs where um, this is uh, that they have more restrictions. Um, what we also see is that um, the lack of personal protective equipment and therefore the fear of getting contaminated ourselves can impact the way we treat our patients. Um, I think it we work in a hospital where um, um, in an infectious disease unit. So we are used to um, uh, infectious disease, whether it's, you know, the contamination is by airborne droplets or contact, which means we're familiar with this kind of diseases, but it's not the case with um, other wards. Um, because in the time of, you know, in the time of outbreak, a lot of wards have been dedicated their team to COVID treatment. And all these staff are not always very used to this kind of um, um, protocols. And it's actually scary. Um, it's scary for the patient and it can also be scary for the health workers as well. So how do you um, make sure you respect the patient's dignity while um, assuring your own safety. Um, I'm sorry, it seems that we're experiencing a bit of difficulty with love sound. Yes, we That's hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think luckily in Paris, um, the fact that the country in France was affected unevenly, um, the country could concentrate the resources, uh, either material, human, um, in the areas that were the most affected, um, which means we didn't experience um, lack of staff. We could still, we had many nurses. We, I had, you know, the previous doctor um, saying that in ICU it was uh, really stretched while in a normal COVID-19 ward, we could be um, one nurse for four patients, which is, um, um, we were very lucky. So we had, um, the re human resources, maybe not um, the equipment that we we still had issue with the protective equipment, but um, our feeling was that the current outbreak uh, did not um, affect the way we were treating patients, which is not the case everywhere, as I um, mentioned before. Um, this is, I think, uh, an important dilemma um, because, I mean, if you want to give the best care you want to your 
patience. Um, you need to feel you're safe yourself. Um, and we had a lot of um, sick uh, colleagues and we even had to resuscitate, resuscitate uh, one of our colleagues in our own ward. Um, so the fear was there for everyone, um, patients and um, health workers alike. Um, and um, a last thing was, um, I think the COVID protocols as they were at the time and are at the time um, could also impact the body, the respect of the body and the patient's dignity as um, whenever we had um, death in our ward and because of the outbreak, it happened quite a lot, unfortunately. Uh, we had to seal the body naked um, in the mortuary bag, whether before you could um, dress them up. Um, so this is also a dilemma. Uh, do the... Um, we, we need to draw a line between, you know, because these guidelines were in place because there is still a risk of contamination after death. And yes, the dilemma comes where, where do you draw the line between uh, the need to control the outbreak and the respect of the patient's dignity? No, uh, I, I, I know this is, uh, I will try to, I, I really want, I know it's a very difficult testimony and it's not definitely not very obvious. I really want to thank you for, because I, it was very important that we have a nurse on, on board with us, not just, not only uh, doctors. So I, I thank you very much for, for your testimony. It's, it's, it was precious and I know it wasn't easy for you to come forward. Yeah. I'd like to thank you because I think these crucial, you know, these crucial issues, even as nurse, even during uh, an outbreak, to keep our patients, you know, uh, to keep our patients' dignity is, is still our priority. I know. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to pass, uh, to turn now to Rita, Rita Sharon. Thank you. Thank you, Smadar. Um, and Thank you also very, very much, Laura, for having given us this um, um, major testimony, uh, not only about the privacy of the patient's body, but really also the privacy of um, the other bodies in the room. And uh, of all of the issues, I'm so impressed. Um, um, so I'm a general internist and I'm a literary scholar. I, I study narratology. I study how stories are told and understood and received. And I find the most um, impressive part of what Laura just did to be in how she was able to nest one dilemma in another. And she started talking about the privacy of the patient's body, even after death. Um, and then did you see how seamlessly she was able to draw in the privacy of the clinician's body, uh, all dressed in the PPE? Um, the fact that the fear for the clinician's own life and the fear for the clinician's colleagues' lives could not be separated from the concern about the dignity uh, and privacy of the patient. So I just take Laura's uh, testimony as overall for this entire symposium, um, describing to us the profound, uh, they're not just dilemmas, they're paradoxes, um, uh, uh, where one thing does not rule out its opposite. Um, I also wanna say thank you to the, uh, the Columbia Global Centers uh, Paris, Nairobi, Amman, Istanbul, because this is a international um, 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 pandemic. And the more we can remember that we are not isolated and we are not uh, solving our own parochial problems, the better. But let me turn just a little to the notions that rise up in my mind anyway, when I think of the privacy of patients' bodies. 
Um, it's a very old, old question. I mean, read uh, the Journal of the Plague Year of Defoe and, and read Dr. Rieux again, if you haven't already, to see how these questions of contagion and, and danger and uh, 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 privacy have been with us in all the plagues from 16th century, 17th century on. Um, remember too, and this has been uh, um, uh, mentioned in some of the earlier testimonies, remember too that the hospital itself is a strange, um, insoluble mix of public and private that illness itself is a subjective experience, a meaningful experience that happens within the context of an individual life, as it is at the same time, a public situation where um, some culture, society, group has to do the best they can to uh, 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 protect others. Um, um, uh, it was 18th, 19th century that the hospital became, in the words of Foucault anyway, the place not where persons got cared for, but the place where scientists and physicians were able to study and objectify uh, these human bodies, which were kind of cataloged into uh, their own uh, uh, organ system, if you will. So we studied the heart, and we studied the lungs, and we studied the, the kidneys, so as to learn and not necessarily to um, be with those who were suffering. Um, you know, it wasn't until 1914 when Cardozo wrote his, his judgment that we had a firm, at least in the U.S., legal uh, um, uh, platform to say the patient's body belongs to the patient. And it was very clear. And if a surgeon were to operate on a patient without their consent, the surgeon would be liable to charges of criminal assault. So th these are the, these are the uh, again, paradoxes that exist as we take on the very narrow question that Laura started us with, which is, can we show on television the naked bodies of dead COVID patients? Right? I mean, that was the question we, we started with. So, so um, what are the traditions, what are the bodies of thought that are now available to us that were not available to Defoe or to Camus um, um, in, in these prior very similar plagues? Um, um, uh, we, we heard from, from um, uh, our former speaker about, oh, it was Smada who brought in Levinas. And the phenomenological tradition, continental philosophy, Merleau-Ponty, Husserl, uh, through Levinas and others, have reminded us that the body is the, forgive me, thing, is the, the avenue through which the self lives in the world. And without our bodies, we are not in the world. It is through our perception, through our sensation, that we're able to actually um, um, not just address, but come into contact with and, and confront the real, whatever the real might mean. And that without the body, we have only our own imaginary representations of, of what we see out there. So that when we talk about the body of the patient, we are talking about the life of the patient um, and, and not a Cartesian, you know, disengaged uh, sense that one can think of one's body outside of the self. It is also the case, uh, and I so appreciate that we have been set up in this conversation by a nurse, it is also the case that the body of the clinician is involved as well, not just the body of the patient. Um, and, and, and that we, um, through the phenomenological assertions, realize that all of us, all of us, patients, physicians, nurses, uh, um, families, are, um, our own living bodies are inseparable from who we are. So this brings us to feminist concerns, ethics of care concerns within bioethics that state very uh, clearly that care is, is relational, that there is no care 
without the relation one-to-one -one of the um, one being cared for um, and the one who is giving the care, whether that be professionals or um, families. So that we have very direct, the patient's body is in our hands. The patient's body has been entrusted to this clinician who is um, there in her or his own body, whether or not it's covered over by, by PPE. Um, I remind you that from virtue ethics, modesty is a virtue. So that for, for some, some cultures and religions more than others, uh, Muslim, Amish, Jewish, for example, that um, what one does with the body is prescribed by, by those faiths. So this, I have a minute and I will bring us back now to that scene in the intensive care unit with television cameras or still cameras um, um, taking images, taking images from the bed of a unconsented patient and putting that in the public media. And all I can say is, number one, um, this seems like a rather greedy gesture on the part of the media to take what they think will be the most shocking and the most arresting images. Um, I wish that the photographers were perhaps more skilled, that they might capture um, perhaps less violent um, and shocking images, but perhaps more telling images. You all remember um, the, the photographs of, uh, in, in Holocaust times where it's the pile of children's shoes that most speak to the horror. Um, so these, these are just many, many dimensions of what it is that Laura asked us to think about. Um, and I'm eager to see what the questions are. Thank you to both Rita and Lau. Um, if you can both join us to the discussion. Um, I just, I want to say, I, I think that the question is very, incredibly important. I have to say that I had a lot of messages of people saying, uh, asking to raise this issue, not wanting necessarily to speak out, but really like, can you say this and can you say that? And can all very much related to the privacy of the body, to the, uh, of the patient, to the dignity of the patient, to the uh, respect of the body because, uh, and I just want to make a, a precision in regard to Laura, she uh, spoke about taking photos of um, uh, only uh, patients who are alive, sometimes under coma, um, but uh, no, not of dead bodies, this is not allowed. Um, so I, I wanted to, uh, before Krista will take a, another question from the audience, and I just remind the audience that you have to ask the questions now, not when the session is over, <laughs> possible, because then we really regret. It's got, it happens in every session. Uh, I wanted to ask both of you, uh, if, if you think, you know, in, in, in a COVID where the enemy, as people like to present it, I don't see it's an enemy, but it's, it's invisible. And people don't realize uh, how dangerous this is. Some people even think it's not really exist and it's just uh, a, a public paranoia and, and um, frenzy. So do you think there is a way, a better way uh, to um, express the situation to the public and the urgency and the danger without exposing the patient or, or the body uh, in a sense that will be demeaning? in a sense for them. So maybe uh, Rita would like to answer first and then Laura will answer. Well, I, I mean, I think there are myriad ways. Uh, and, and I mean, it just needs a little ingenuity on the part of the media to know to whom to speak, who should be interviewed, who should be the voice, what voices are necessary to hear. Um, we need voices of, of families, we need voices of persons who are particularly at risk, 
for this, and I appreciate Catherine's reminding us all about the social determinants of, of illness. We need to hear from persons who are most apt to be threatened by this. Um, and however opulent New York City is, uh, we don't have we don't have access to the opulence when we're in the city hospitals doing our best on very limited budgets to treat all those who come. So I, I would hope to bring in the voices that count and not just um, pictures that are supposed to shock. Laura, did you want to say a few words about this? Yeah. So for me, I think I wish we could hear the voice um, of those of reco who recovered, you know, the one who's been through yeah. all of these, um, you know, to show how severe it is, but in the meantime, to, to, you know, to show there is hope and many, many people also are uh, recovering from this. Um, this is severe, but we can also, you know, we got this. Mm -hmm. Right, you can, I mean, it, it is something one can, sur that, that one can survive, um, but I'm also thinking back to our earlier testimonies. Patients are very frightened to come to hospital, and there are excess deaths. Uh, in, in New York, it's like 3,000 excess deaths uh, that, that we are seeing, and they're not all deaths by COVID. They're deaths by people who stayed home with their heart attack and people who stayed home with their stroke. So, so uh, the way in which news and so-called, and, and as close as we can get to fact uh, are presented have drastic implications, um, not only for now, but also for how our health system will survive, whether our health system will lose all credibility uh, with potential patients or not, whether clinicians can remain being seen as responsible, trustworthy um, servants of the people. So there's so much at stake. Thank you both. I'm going to uh, go to an audience question um, for the two of you, and maybe we'll just stay in the same order. Uh, someone asks, media, as well as social media, has played a nefarious part in this pandemic, mm -hmm. as is with other events. Do you believe that there's a way to hold media outlets to a larger, higher ethical standard as a global necessity without necessarily censoring our media? Um, and they add a side note, much in the way uh, that the shoes of Holocaust children were shown rather than their bodies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you raised the question of free enterprise and capitalism. Um, I don't know if I'm being heard. Am I being heard? Yes. 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 Uh, you know, who, who, can, who can control and censor private enterprise? Um, Media outlets are, on the whole, um, you know, owned by individuals and shareholders. Um, I don't live in a country that has a nationalistic um, government-controlled media. I don't think they tend to work uh, any more democratically than ours. Um, but thank you for that question. And I think it and many others um, regarding our free enterprise, profit-driven uh, forms of social interaction, um, uh, I hope, will be put into question by, by this pandemic. I, I'm not terribly confident that it will, but I would hope so. Thank you. Laura, did, did you wish to weigh in on this question? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to take another question from the audience. Uh, this is directed to Dr. Sharon. Can you elaborate a bit more on the idea of the body of physicians, which is pertinent? In what ways would the body of physicians differ from those of patients? How can we imagine a history of the body of physicians that would intersect and or divert from that of the patient that has so far received most of the attention? Thank you. Mm. Um. I would hope that this pandemic helps all health professionals to remember that at 
at the beginning and at the end, they with their patients are fellow mortals. Um, in New York, there's become this strange practice of every night at seven o'clock, we open the windows and we, and, and we clap. And we're clapping for all of those, the bus drivers, the sanitation workers, the cops, uh, in addition to the doctors and nurses who are seeing us through this situation. My colleagues, the health professionals say, don't clap for me. I'm not a hero. I don't wanna be a hero. If you call me a hero, that means I'm invincible. I don't want to be invincible. I know how, but I don't want to be. Do you see? So, so all, all of these questions are about reducing, perhaps, the distance between the patient and the clinician. Um, and and this, this pandemic could make us go in either direction. I, I'm a little alarmed to see how quickly we in the U.S. are adopting telehealth, for example, which is a way to have a clinical encounter, uh, each of you on your own separate screen. Well, it's fine. It, it, it saves time. It saves money. You don't need all those offices. Um, but the two bodies are never in the room together. And there are things that I come to understand about patients simply by being in a room with them. So, and, and if I say body, um, um, in the context of the phenomenological inseparability of the body from the life, I'm talking about the body and the self, that the body's never there without the self. So, so yes, it's important to be able to do a physical exam, to examine someone's uh, liver, to listen to their heart, but it is also important to have that elemental, intimate, being with, face to face, that can promote trust and courage and uh, care. Thank you very much, uh, Rita and Laure. Um, it was very, very touching uh, session. I, I want to thank both. I want to say. I want. I also want to say to to thank your dialogue because Law gave uh, a testimony and Rita you did you began with uh, actually doing sort of a demonstration of what narrative medicine is at the beginning of your talk so I was I, I'm happy people could could see how it goes how you do that uh, for physicians and for the so that was um, thank you both very much and I just want to re respond to questions uh, well there were a lot not, there are a lot of questions we cannot take, but I just want to say for a practical thing, this um, webinar is going to be registered and it will be made available for the public so people can view it. Some people ask for uh, bibliograph bibliographical references all along as we speak. Um, I, as I said, there will be a publication. We will try to find a way to make it accessible also in regard to the uh, registration so people can have access both to the references via video and in writing and in what we're going to publish from this talk. So thank you both very, very much. It's always a pleasure and uh, take very good care. Um, I'd like to now pass to the next um, dilemma, um, which concerns, it's our last dilemma. It's a very difficult one. Uh, it's called honoring death. And uh, the questions uh, we wanted to raise here is, does public interest in social distancing overweigh the patient's right not to die alone and the family's right uh, to be with their dying relatives? And obviously it regards the question uh, that touched so many countries and so many uh, families. So I want to thank uh, mine and Chris uh, Krittinger from Italy, who will be the first one to speak. Uh, and then uh, Jeremy Simon, who's both a doctor and a philosopher, is going to follow up. So Maini, are you here? Dr. Maini Krittinger? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I hope you're going to... Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you, Smada and Krista, for giving me the opportunity to present at this conference. Thank you as well for giving me the easy part, which is presenting the dilemma and not having to do comment on the solutions, which is much more difficult. Thanks also to everybody watching the conference for holding on so long. 
I live in South Tyrol in the north of Italy, close to Austria. That's my non-Italian accent and my non-Italian name. We are about two hours drive north of Bergamo and Bergamo is one of the epicenters of the pandemic. We serve a population of about half a million. We have one large referral hospital and four smaller hospitals with ICU facilities. The experience I'm referring to is in part my own experience as an intensivist and anesthetist, in part the experience of colleagues and also of my wife who works as an infectious medicine specialist in the main hospital. We did have some forewarning from our colleagues south about what we could expect, so we had time to prepare. We ramped up ICU beds from 20 to 60, converting operation theaters. Um, we created dedicated COVID wards in all the hospitals. In my intensive care unit, we routinely offer family of dying patients a possibility where they can stay with their relative, even though we have a visitor limit of two persons. In those situations, any number of family can enter ICU and they would have their dedicated space uh, with makeshift barriers for privacy. What concerns the dilemma of honoring death during the COVID epidemic, all rules were to be turned upside down. A task force with superpowers consisting out of only one doctor with clinical experience could rule on all decisions made in the hospitals. One of the first decisions was no visitors. This task force was installed by the Italian government. Uh, it was according to an Italian law that regulates epidemics. And last time it was applied was during the 80s, uh, during the AIDS epidemic, where it was not clear what was killing those patients. And those patients had to die alone in isolation units. Also the complete lockdown prohibited all movements in town. So not only did the patient have to die alone, also the family that was left behind had to stay in quarantine and could not meet to mourn. Since death affected mostly elderly patients, the family often consisted of an older spouse that had to endure this difficult time, confused and startled, without the assistance of children and in-laws. All corpses, according to the laws of epidemic, this epidemic regulations, were undressed, covered with disinfectant, and dipped into a plastic bag. Clothing brought by the family, as is custom um, in our country here, to dress the dead was discarded. The family only saw their loved ones when the box with the ashes were returned. Also funerals were reduced to a gathering of a maximum 10 people with no church service and a duration of no longer than a few minutes. In contrast to other terminal conditions that we see in the hospital or saw in the hospitals, we found that people, that patients with COVID that were denied intubation and admission to our ICU due to severe concomitant diseases were quite alert until their final hours and suffered even more not being able to see their family and also knowing that they were suffering from a disease where no cure exists. My wife told me about one case where it was the dying person's last wish to see his dog. So his little dog was smuggled into the COVID unit for, for a 10 minute farewell. I know of another patient where the family was allowed to see the dying patient through a closed window through the uh, that was leading out to a balcony. 
In several cases, printouts of the family members were stuck up on the wall around the patient so that the patient at least had the feeling that his family would accompany him. Some of the patients even stated that the cleaning and nursing staff, the ones that had the most contact with them, was their new family now. This is the way it was handled in the referral hospital. But I know that in the other smaller hospitals of the region, one family member was allowed to stay with the patient dying of COVID. So it looks as if regarding the dilemma of honoring death, the epidemic has abolished patient rights as was lamented a month ago in a letter sent to the task force by our provincial ethical committee. But unfortunately, they never responded. All right, back to you, Smada. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know it's a difficult, very difficult topic, uh, especially as, as I said at the beginning, we are still living the pandemic uh, um, all around the world. Some places is in a more enhanced way and others in less. So thank you for this testimony. And um, I'd like to pass to Jeremy, Jeremy Simon. He's both, I just want to say, you're probably going to say, but you're both a doctor and a philosopher, so you have both perspectives. So thank you, Jeremy. Uh, yes, I, I am a practicing physician. I'm an attending in the emergency room uh, at Columbia here in New York, the same hospital that uh, Dr. Fishkoff uh, works at. And I also have a PhD in philosophy, which I use in philosophy of medicine uh, and uh, medical ethics. And I'm on the ethics committee here uh, at Columbia with Dr. Fishkoff. Uh, so the question we're dealing with here is honoring death. Does the public's interest in social distancing outweigh the patient's right not to die alone and the family's right to be with their dying relative? The issues raised by the situation Dr. Kritzinger describes and which uh, was somewhat reflected uh, in New York as well uh, in this regard need to be ethically analyzed on two levels. The first is the question of the nature of the rights under consideration and the second is the question of the nature of rights in general at this time of public health crisis. The dilemma is posed presupposes two different but related rights. That of the patient not to die alone, bereft of their family, and that of the family members not to be separated from their dying loved one. Of course, it would be difficult to honor one of these rights without honoring the other, but with two rights in play, there are more arguments to be made in favor of respecting them. One might think that the right of the dying person is the more powerful right here. The dying are often given special consideration due to their status, even those being executed, last meal, cigarette, blindfold. The right to have comfort in dying, which ordinarily is not problematic, would seem to be something that they are entitled to. And certainly on some level they are. Being alone in a stressful time is frightening and patients have a right not to be subject to undue fear. But if we focus on the right to visitors, particularly of the dying and not of all patients, this right may seem to be somewhat reduced, especially in the current situation. First, patients can only be considered dying for a brief part of their hospitalization when it becomes clear that they cannot be kept alive much longer or when life support is being relieved, removed. Thus, any harm that may be caused by violating this right is mitigated by the relatively short time during which it is being violated and the patients are exposed to unnecessary stress. Second, and this is relevant particularly to COVID, a large percentage of the patients who die are intubated and sedated at that point. Even to the extent that patients in general may have a right not to die alone, it is not clear that this right extends to unconscious patients. It is not to say that it doesn't, it may be an intrinsic matter of human dignity not to be abandoned at the time of death. But hospitalized patients are not abandoned. They're not even without those who care for them. They are just without those with whom they have long-term bonds of affection. Note that the second point is of limited applicability since many patients die without being intubated. In those cases, the other arguments presented will have to suffice. What then are the family? They're conscious 
and the harm done to them could potentially reverberate for years to come. And familiar rights are certainly recognized in medical ethics, at least when it comes to surrogate decision making, at least in America, although I assume elsewhere to a certain degree as well. Perhaps it is their right then that is stronger. But whether or not it is stronger, it cannot be absolute. For there is a very simple case where a hospital may and must keep such a visitor out. For instance, at the patient's request. Likewise, if the family members behave badly, even to the staff during these visits, they will not be allowed. This, of course, is not what is happening here. However, it does show that the family's right to, to visit is defeasible. These then are the rights in question. What I've shown thus far is not that they don't exist here, just that they may not be as solid as they at first appear. The next question, how should we approach rights during the, is to, how should we approach rights during the time of pandemic? Traditionally, ethical analyses can be broken down into two types, consequentialist or outcomes-based and deontological or rules-based. A consequentialist or utilitarian decides whether an action is rights-based, is, is right, sorry, decides whether an action is right based on the outcome that results. Did it create more good in the world than the alternative? A rules-based ethicist sees whether an action follows certain ethical rules, thou shalt and thou shalt not, without looking to see what the impact is necessarily of following those rules in the given case. But that dichotomy is a bit misplaced here. Even a deontologist, a rule-based ethicist, may have rules that take into account outside impacts. So to have a specifically rules-based argument that visits to a dying patient are a right at this time, one would have to have a rule that implied that not only was it a right, but that it was a more or less absolute first-tier right that no amount of bad consequences could override. I have trouble seeing that in general, and certainly in light of the arguments made earlier. That was a bit quick, I'm afraid. The main point was just to argue that we need to analyze the ethics of our dilemma as to whether the public's interest in social distancing outweighs the patient's right not to die alone and the family to be with their dying relative based on the real world consequences of taking one side or the other, and not based on abstract, timeless rules. Therefore, we are left considering the consequences of allowing or not allowing visits to dying patients during the COVID pandemic. Ultimately, answering this question requires objective data, or at least assumptions about such data, about the risk to visitors of acquiring COVID, and then perhaps also spreading it to others outside the hospital, and the risk of these visitors already having COVID and spreading it within the hospital. This is information that I certainly don't have. It also, the decision also depends on the organization, at least of the intensive care units and the potential visitors, uh, the potential disruption that visitors could cause, at least if the patient's in the intensive care unit. I know that at our hospital at Columbia, as Dr. Fishkop uh, mentioned, operating rooms have been turned into intensive care units. So that in addition to the MICU or medical intensive care unit and SICU or surgical intensive care unit, we now have, or had until yesterday, a new beast called the ORICU, or Operating Room Intensive Care Unit. These uh, makeshift uh, intensive care units do not necessarily have the same space and barrier that normal intensive care units have, and may have less room for extra visitors, or extra people in the form of visitors in the room. If we, once we have this information, or we make the assumptions that we want to make, um, how can we use it to make a decision here? Certainly, if wearing a simple mask is enough to prevent getting COVID or spreading infection, then the danger to the visitors, to the other patients, and to society at large uh, is minimal, not a real issue there, um, and would not be a reason to forbid visitors. Of course, we don't know this to be the case, and so such danger must be considered. Given the degree of disruption to everything else that our assessment of the risk of COVID is causing, it is not unreasonable although not necessary, to take a conservative approach here too and refuse uh, entrance to visitors into the hospital, except when absolutely necessary, uh, by which I mean when the patient can't even be taken care of without a visitor for some reason. Know that the risk of the visitor is only part of the issue here, which is why we can't leave it up to the visitors. Um, 
as to whether they want to take a risk or not. There's also risk to society and other patients. But even if the risk is small, uh, a return of infection, the disruption of the intensive care units, and especially the makeshift ones, uh, could be real. And I think that there's an argument to be made that if some intensive care unit patients, intensive care units can't have beds, none should. At the very least, different policies on, for different units could lead to arbitrary distinctions, would lead to arbitrary distinctions between patients. And at the worst, it could lead to placing patients in preferred intensive care units for non-medical VIP or very important person reasons which is certainly unjust. Thus, I think that while keeping visitors away from dying patients is certainly a bad thing, it is not an absolute wrong and may indeed be justified at times, perhaps even now. We broadly restrict rights during public health emergencies and the right to visit is not stronger than others and is perhaps weaker than some of the even more fundamental rights, such as engaging in religious worship and commerce that life under COVID has of necessity interfered with. Nonetheless, if it is possible to have a safe, nuanced policy with small numbers of visitors to those patients who would benefit from it, this is certainly desirable. Um, one might think that I'm uh, that based on my uh, my the fact that I kind of come out. Maybe we shouldn't have visitors. That uh, I'm not sensitive to the uh, to the feelings here. So I definitely want to uh, I want to just uh, read something that was published in the New York Times online just yesterday evening. It's by Gabriel, let's take 30 more seconds. It's by Gabriel Garcia Marquez's son uh, in the form of a letter that he's writing to his late father describing uh, what's going on. Also tells us a lot about uh, his father. Uh, and he says, it's not just death that frightens us, but the circumstances. A final exit without goodbyes, attended by strangers dressed as extraterrestrials, machines beeping heartlessly, surrounded by others in, sim in similar situations, but far from our people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, this is a very touchy question, uh, topic. Um, I'd like to, to pass to the first uh, question and I invite people who, who became uh, who <laughs> want to ask questions, do ask questions. We, we, we will try to answer. I want to ask a first question to both of you. Um, the question is as such, does death should be um, reinforced as part of life and um, our post-mortem societies will not escape the contingency of death, uh, whatever progress uh, biomedical sciences does. So um, they said that this dream does not nourish uh, humanism that although medicine has promised somehow they to overcome uh, death and this leads me to this comment actually uh, leads me to another one that relates to this comment so this is a question death um, so the question is do you think that we should avoid uh, maybe society uh, should uh, this reaction of society that alert is it, uh, this allergy to death from society? Can we understand uh, the need to protect ourselves from the virus of the dying patient? But maybe we can just imagine an alternative scenario that would minimize the trauma for all for all of us. So, question related to this taboo about death in in COVID pandemic times. Shall I comment? Um, two, two points. Um, first, a practical point. I don't see why, why uh, relatives of patients cannot wear the same protection that nurses and doctors wear and thus um, stay with the, somebody who is dying. And the other point, generally, uh, death has become a disease that needs to be cured and not uh, part of the life cycle, which is normal for everybody and which the only certainty we all have. So this is my general remark. Jerry, do, do you think, no? I don't so, have anything particular to add. Okay. Um, I, a person asks you, uh, it is very interesting, correctly, uh, ethically, Jeremy's speech, but how does a patient feel without the family? And how does the family feel? And uh, mainly, how does the medical staff feel telling the family not allowing to say goodbye to their dear ones? That's a question that I also had from other channels. So if you could answer this one. 
Um, I mean, I can, uh, and Manny can perhaps answer, uh, of course, as well, because he's dealt with patients. I can answer do you, having dealt with different patients. Um, the patients don't like it, the families don't like it, um, and the providers don't like it either. Um, it keeps the hospital quieter, but nobody likes telling their, uh, their patients and their families that they can't have visitors. Um, uh, visiting patients in the hospital is, uh, is uh, you know, is almost fundamental to the experience of being in the hospital. Um, it's a tragedy when patients don't have visitors. If you have a patient in the hospital under in ordinary times, at least, who doesn't have any visitors, uh, it's quite remarkable and something that raises great concern among the entire team. Uh, so uh, no one likes it. Um, and um, many might even be right, it may, perhaps it could be made safe for the patients, although certainly at the time these decisions were being made in New York, uh, we were concerned about having enough uh, protective gear for the physicians, um, and we're probably not uh, comfortable assigning uh, quantities of it uh, to visitors who didn't have to be in the hospital. Um, now it seems to me that we have enough, although actually I don't know what the supply chains are like. Um, but certainly if it could be made safe, that would be great. Everybody would prefer that. Miney, do you want to say something about this? I don't think I can add. No. Well, you see, it's, uh, as I was saying, we had this task force with the superpowers that would overrule every, everything and everybody in the hospital. And I personally, we felt very, very bad of having patients to die without their family there. So that's why in ICU it was a bit more difficult, but in, in the normal wards, they tried to bypass the ruling with, uh, as I say, they were smuggling the little dog in and nobody's allowed to know and things like this. Do, do you, uh, I have a few questions. I have them from, um, how do you, people ask, how do you overcome this stressful situation of not saying goodbye? Um, and since uh, I know, Maini, you spoke about the suffering of people who are, who are dying and still have the expectation of a few last hours and knowing that they're going to die alone. So I think the question of a stressful situation of not saying goodbye could be applied both to the dying person and to the family. So maybe you want to... Um, talk about it's basically the trauma of dying alone for both the family and the patient so how to overcome this stressful situation of not saying goodbye it's a very hard question i think so many families had to deal with it so Maine, if you want to speak um, how i personally would deal with the problem mm. uh, first of all i would be very clear with the family and uh, I do that all the time. I always, when I, um, we, you know, this um, um, discussions about death is not something uh, that we started with COVID. It, we always have to do that as intensivists. You have to tell somebody that uh, their loved ones are going to be dying. Um, what I tell them is, if there's anything they ever wanted to say, um, they must say it now because this is the last chance and um, whether they want to say you know how much I love this person anything um, so this is my approach to it I'm, I'm quite direct um, also in our part of the society um, we are able to talk about death as being part of you know the life cycle Whereas uh, we see, especially I come from a rural area, we see that people living in the city, they avoid death more. And then there you gotta be a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more delicate. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank both of you for your uh, for discussing this very, very important issue. Uh, I want to also thank the audience for all their questions and their thoughts and their comments. Uh, it's very enlightening. I think other people could share them and we could uh, see them too. And we'll try to 
um, contact those who asked. Thank you to all the participants. And um, I'd like uh, to pass the, 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 the turn to Krista, who's going uh -huh. to um, explain to us uh, about the last few information regarding the registration of this uh, uh, symposium. So thank you very, very much, Jeremy, and thank you, Maini. Thank you, Dr. Bustam. And um, I think I can speak for everyone by saying thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. Uh, more importantly, for your continued professional work. To those of you who tuned in, thank you again for joining us. And note that this webinar will be made available on our website, as well as on our YouTube station, both of which will be referenced on the following slide. Thank you and take care. <laughs>